we're, we're kind of nearing the end of, uh, of, of, of the advanced R book. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I think this is the set of chapters um, on uh, kind of metaprogramming, I think we're, we're widely viewed as kind of some of the most, uh, most uh, anticipated uh, by our group. Um, I know for me, I've, I've dabbled in this in the past. So um, being able to work on the notes was really nice to help begin to solidify or re solidify my knowledge about, about these topics. Um, so today I'll be talking about quasi quotation, um, which is a really strange name. Um, I, I'm still not quite sure I understand why this name was chosen, but this is the name quasi quotation. Um, so since it's a strange name, <clears throat> uh, you may be asking kind of the same question I did, you know, what is quasi quotation? Uh, and then a couple other questions like why, why might it be useful? You know, how could I use it for my work? How does it work? And um, you know, maybe what are some, some practical use cases for quasi quotation? So I'm gonna endeavor to go over each one of those today. Um, so first kind of briefly about quasi quotation. Quasi quotation um, um, is, is simply um, a, kind of consists of two pieces. Um, quoting and unquoting. Um, if you think back to uh, last last um, last time, I think already kind of the idea of quoting had had come into play. So, you know, we, when, whenever we have a function that's being evaluated, we can look at the abstract syntax tree, um, and then elements of the abstract syntax tree are kind of um, evaluated, like they point to to whatever the definitions are of the arguments provided, right? So in practical terms, quasi quotation uh, has gives us as as developers uh, the ability to kind of stop evaluation of certain branches of the abstract sy sy syntax tree, um, uh, and, and then to unquote those branches later when we when we need to, uh, because remember with 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 R, whenever you kind of mention an object, uh, it's it's going to be the default is behavior is that it that that the, the that named object will be evaluated instantly, right? In some cases, we don't want it to be. Um, so we want to um, basically um, defer evaluation of, of 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 a particular object or like an argument for a function. I think that's probably the most typical case and probably the easiest way to think about it. Um, and I may mix up the the terminology as we go. So um, the book talks about quoting and unquoting. Um, if you look at the R language or so the R lang um, documentation um, in its current version, you'll see that they talk about diffusing and injecting. Um, so I may interchange the two. Basically, they kind of mean the same thing. So quoting, quoting is basically not stopping the evaluation, the normal evaluation uh, of a function argument or, or of an expression, typically a function argument, so that <clears throat> that the the contents of that that um, that expression can be evaluated later. So maybe the that expression could be modified um, before it's evaluated, or it could just be evaluated but evaluated in a different context or a different kind of functional environment. Um, and, and then you know we got un unquoting here, um, which is basically once we're ready once we're ready to evaluate that that quoted expression, we have a mechanism. Where, whereby we can we can finally evaluate that that expression at the moment we want to and in the context in which we want to. Um, this will make more sense as we come, but just think of two kind of two moves, you know, quote and unquote, uh, or in our lang jargon, diffuse and inject. Yeah, sorry, was there a question? If so, feel free to jump in. Um, yeah, so continuing on, um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, me, it's me, it's me. Oh, yes, so, there you go. yeah, so, um, so you, you, uh, basically use these things to uh, make evaluations. Yeah, so, so I mean, how, yeah. 
Oh, go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. So, I mean, um, is that um, something that we can uh, like see uh, how to yes. do? Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so so I think this will it'll make a little bit more sense as I get a bit more practical about it. So, like, you know, why use quasi quotation? They're kind of like a few broad use cases. <clears throat> you know, one, and this is you know, each each of these I think are kind of in their way an, an example. Um, I'll come by other examples, but let's say like make make functions tidy. So if you think about one characteristic of the tidyverse, uh, um, you know, it's that um, you're maybe writing code like this, like dplyr filter empty cars data set where, where the number of cylinders equals four, right? Now, if you stop and think, this is actually kind of a funny way to write uh, an argument, basically an argument to a function, right? This, no problems here. This is, this is an object that exists in the global environment, the empty cars data set. But here we're referring to this number of cylinders, right? That's not an environment variable. That's that's a that's a that's a column in the data set. Um, so this is kind of a practical case where the tidyverse is sort of made use of quasi quotation. So they kind of take this user input and they they say, okay, we're not going to evaluate this at this moment because this 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 object doesn't exist, and so this expression would not be able to be evaluated without error. And instead, we're going to take this user input and then, you know, bring it into kind of um, how this is evaluated um, within within the function itself. So it's going to say like this is a this is this is a column in the data set. Um, so I mean, that's kind of one example. Uh, I'm not showing that it's being done, but this is kind of one one use case, I guess. Um, another another use case would be, uh, you know, if you're making functions that you want to be more or less compatible with Shiny. Uh, I mean, think about you know um, some kind of interactive um, exploratory analysis app that you've developed in Shiny, uh, where you know you've got your 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 data set, uh, and then some some selector in the in the UI where you select the variable um, the variable um, to graph. Let's say, um, well, um, you know what's going to come to Shiny in the back end is sort of this you know input dollar sign and then whatever the name of the the, the selector you've, you've you've given right. So if you you would want a function that would accept uh, uh, you know a, a variable you know some argument that's that's a string, but but then would kind of treat it treat it as if it um, were were not a string. Like here's kind of a case where we're just passing the string to to this computation. Uh, this is kind of a clever way of using the uh, R R Lang syntax. So you have the kind of the data pronoun, and then you say like this particular column in the data set, that's one way of doing it. Another way might be, um, uh, you know, instead to convert your your string into a symbol and then evaluate that symbol in something akin to that, right? Um, and then also like one last use case that I won't go into very much is, uh, you know, maybe you can write a function in such a way that uh, it accomplishes a certain set of steps. Um, but for some of those steps, the user may, through the arguments of the function, uh, define kind of in detail what's what's being done. So, for example, you could say have some kind of uh, logic in your function that that summarizes variables, maybe does some grouping, and then does summarize. And the the end the end user of the function can could write the expressions, uh, you know, that would say which which variables are are computed and how they're computed. Um, or another use case, you could maybe rename data in some some pipeline, and and you could have the end user pass an expression to the function that says, you know, here here's how I want to rename my variables, um, et cetera. So these are kind of a few ways in which in which tidy evaluation could could be used. I, I know this is still kind of a little abstract. Um, we'll we'll look right now kind of about the mechanics of how actually to use quasi quotation. Maybe some of this will come a little bit more clear. Um, so we'll kind of look in turn at the three, the what to my mind are kind of like three pieces, two to three pieces of quasi quotation. First, quoting expressions. Second, unquoting expressions. And lastly, there's a, a mechanism now with with the kind of the tidy evaluation to quote and unquote in the, at, the, at the same time. Um, so let's look at quoting. So um, there's some base R ways to do this. I'm only going to go over the 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 tidyverse, um, or sorry, the Rlang uh, versions of doing this. 
Um, so one way that you can quote an expression is with uh, R Lang's uh, EXPR for, you know, uh, um, that'll, that'll basically quote an expression. So normally if we have our, in, in our environment, we have some variable, you know, some, some variable X and some variable Y defined. Um, you know, normally if we kind of added them together, then, then that expression would be evaluated. We, you know, add X to Y. There's a way that we can prevent that from happening immediately, and that's basically quote quoting it. Um, so you say R lang EXPR um, you know, X plus Y, and then what this returns is it returns an, an, an expression, um, which is X plus Y. So it's kind of like a blueprint about what's going to happen, but importantly, um, importantly, it doesn't actually do what the blueprint and in, in, in the um, uh, in in the um, in the expression says um, it simply just captures the expression um, so that you know it can be used used or or modified and then used at some some later point in some later way. Um, so this is kind of for interactive use, um, not for use in a function. Uh, so for example, if we tried this in a function, it won't yield the result that, that we hope for. So let's create some function called f1. Uh, that will simply take what, you know, uh, the user um, input X uh, and then quote it. So the content, like the body of the function is this, rlang expr X, which is kind of sort of the same as this. Now let's take that function um, and then uh, we'll let this be X. So uh, A plus B plus C. And what the function returns is X because it's actually just quoting this, this, this expression X, right? It's not quoting the thing that X stands for, which is the user input um, arguments, it's just quoting X. So that's, that's what we get. Um, luckily, there, there's a way in which um, we can kind of maintain this reference from X to the user inputs. Uh, so basically from um, you know, the user inputs outside of the function to kind of the terms of the function itself. And that's with uh, Arlang, uh, in X, e e N E X P R. I don't know how to pronounce these things properly, so bear with me. Um, uh, so basically, this is a function that's similar in form. The only difference is you have E N E X P R instead of E X P R. Otherwise, it's the same function. And let's take again this. Let's create this, uh, this function two, which is the same except that on the you know in the body of the function, it's E N E X P R rather than just uh, uh, E X P R. Um, then if we pass it um, this argument, A plus B plus C, here in contrast to what came before, it'll return A plus B plus C. So in this sense, it's, it's quoting this expression, but um, it's kind of substituting in place of the expression like the thing for which it stands. So this, this, there's a reference from X to A plus B plus C. So here, you know, with with we can quote we can quote expressions. These are all expressions. You know, x plus y, one divided by two. It, it doesn't matter. So the idea is here we can take an expression that can exist as an argument in a function, uh, or can exist el elsewhere, and and we're and we're simply quoting it, um, so that that expression is kind of preserved almost as a character string, right? Uh, and then we can we can do other things with it. We could just take it and then evaluate it later in the body of the function. Um, uh, as it as it was given to the function through through the argument, or we can take that expression and and, and do other things to it. You know, let's say create compose a, another call function call that has the same argument. You know, it contains the same arguments, um, etc. Right. Um, you can also quote quote symbols um, uh, that that may be passed to to the function. So um, let's imagine that you're going to Cast, you're going to capture a list of symbols or a list of strings and then return a list of, of symbols. So here's a function that would do that. So some function f, um, and it's just going to have you know three dots that allows us to pass some list of list of things. And again, um, and then in the body of the function, we have this in sims. So this is a don't, don't worry about too much like what what these particular things do, just more than anything, concentrate on you know the flavor of how this this works. Um, so it's what it, what it's going to do is it's going to capture some symbols that we pass to it, strings or symbols that we pass to the function, and then return uh, a list of 
symbols. So case number one is, you know, let's imagine inputs are symbols. So um, if we take uh, the function of x, so x, this is a symbol. This is some name that in principle like refers to an object in the global environment. So it's a symbol. Um, you know, if, if we, if we uh, do that, then, then we'll get a list. What will be returned by the function is a list of symbols. So this is a, you know, a list with one element and we get x. Um, case number two is, you know, if we, if we pass, if we pass to the function some, some list of character strings, then we're going to get, we're going to get back a list of symbols as well. So here, if instead we take, rather than taking the function of x as a symbol, we take the function of uh, a character string um, x, um, then we'll also get x back. So this, this function right here, this rlang function, um, basically um, uh, it captures the user input um, and then transforms it into a, into a symbol. Um, so that's kind of the broad thing of quoting it. It, it captures a user input, um, uh, input to a function parameter, let's say, um, and then um, you know, captures it in something, but doesn't, importantly, doesn't evaluate it until, um, until the function uh, unquotes it. And, and in so doing evaluates it. So now we'll come to the unquoting part. Um, so, you know, we, we can unquote, we can unquote, um, you know, one argument or multiple arguments. Um, the flavor of this is kind of the same for both. So uh, let's say we, we, um, <clears throat> we're gonna create some object X. Um, so we're just gonna take the value negative one and we're gonna, we're gonna quote it, right? So this becomes a quoted expression. Now, now let's imagine later we want to we want to unquote x. How do, how do we do so? We use this the special operator um, uh, from Arlen called they called the bang bang operator. Um, it's just two exclamation points. Um, so here, let's concentrate on like the enter function right here. We have a function of a few arguments, a function of um, the unquoted value of x and then y. And if we quote this whole thing just to kind of see what happens before evaluation, basically see what code comes to, to r to be evaluated or would have come to r to be evaluated had we evaluated this function, we see that it's a function of negative one and y, which is exactly what we wanted. So um, rather than having be a function of function where the first argument is x and the second argument y, we're seeing because we've unquoted x. We've unquoted this expression where we're actually seeing the value of um, the value of that expression, negative one. The same, the same could be done with, with multiple arguments too. Um, so you'll notice that the form is very much the same where we are, we're creating some object in this case xs, so x's, um, and, um, and then we're, we're, we're capturing user inputs the only difference here is the EXPRS. So note the S. One thing you'll see with Rlang is, um, you know, typically there, there, there's a function for handling one argument, like one thing, and then another function for handling multiple things. And the only difference between them is, is, is in the name. So instead of EXPR, we have EXPRS for quoting expressions. Um, so here we have uh, this, this uh, multiple arguments, one A, um, and negative b. So now we've quoted we've quoted this expression, stored it in xs, the the variable xs, and to unquote it, um, we employ a similar move um, uh, where where we use uh, another unquoting operator. Uh, I guess it's called the bang 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 operator. Uh, so instead of two exclamation points, it's three exclamation points. So two is unquoting for a single thing, an object that contains a single thing, and then um, the three exclamation points unquote something that is more than uh, more than one, more than uh, one thing contains more than one expression. And so then, if if we kind of, you know, if we were to evaluate this expression, um, you know, we're unquoting this. So in, in effect, it kind of we take where where we see this portion, we can kind of in our minds just copy and paste 
the value of the expression, the one a minus b, uh, and indeed that's what we get, right? So um, we get the function of one a negative b and y, right? So it's just uh, this this thing that we pass to excess, um, and then and y, which is the other the other argument. So in this way, we can kind of quote user inputs. Um, uh, we can, or rather, we can quote expressions, and then we can un, unquote um, expressions. Um, I guess let me stop there and see. Like, Federic, is it is it any clearer, or still still not quite clear no, enough? No, very perfect. Great, thank you. I'm sorry. Say again. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I said great. Uh, thank you. So very clear. Um, so now it's just difficult to me because um, I'm not using this those things. Right. So, but in the future, um, I may be able to understand them. Uh, yeah. No. No. I, I mean, I think this is. This is kind of, you know, for me, it was really challenging to wrap my head around this um, um, when I first started using it. Um, for me, I guess it kind of reflected a logic I had in, in, in other programming languages. So I'm, I, I, before coming to R, I was using Stata a lot. Um, and there's this facility in Stata where you can sort of, um, <clears throat> I guess you can see like before compile time in a certain sense, you can, you can, um, Pass variables into into functions and and just sort of like replace kind of replace. Um, you can kind of like construct code with code, right? Um, and and in, in effect, that's kind of what we're what we're doing here. But the mechanisms are are a bit different, and I think at least in my light's a little bit more complicated. And and it's also it's 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 made harder because I think you know depending on your background, I mean, number one, this could be an unfamiliar concept in general. And then if, uh, and then on top of that, there's this kind of difficult jargon and theory that you have to, to, to learn in order really to use it. At least that's been my own experience in this. But I mean, kind of generally the idea is that, uh, you know, if, if you're writing a function, um, like let's say you want to write a function that's kind of like the tidyverse, you need to find a mechanism where you can, um, I mean, if you think about this, like this argument right here in the tidyverse, this is an expression. Right? It's kind of funny that we're passing an expression to an argument of a function. That's a first funny thing, I guess. And the second funny thing is that this expression um, does not make sense in the global environment. It can't be evaluated in the global environment unless you happen to have some variable cycle or, 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 or you know, cylinder CYL that, that exists in the global environment. Um, yeah. Right, so we're, we're we're kind of like passing an instruction to 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 the function, like we're passing code to our code, um, and so we need to have some mechanism so that R doesn't evaluate this before it reaches the inter like the body of the body of the function, because you know R is going to be looking for you know thinking about like abstract abstract syntax tree a little bit, like it's going to be looking at each argument and it's going to try to go from the symbol, the thing that we pass to it for the argument, and then try to look up the the value of, of, of the thing that we pass it, right? And to evaluate expressions. But in some cases, those, those expressions just can't be evaluated in, in, in the current context. Um, so that's that's kind of one one use, one kind of use case. Or, or maybe you might have another one, uh, like let's say you have some function where you're, you're computing means by groups and and then you let your function lets the end user define the group variable well you need to have some kind of reference when you're within your function that points to like this this variable argument but the the variable i don't know it needs to you may want it to be like the tidyverse and have it be a like a bear a bear symbol um and when you write a bear symbol like this like the supposition is that this thing exists in the global environment, but in our case, it it it, it doesn't, right? Um, you know, the CYL object, it's it's not an it's not an environment variable. It's it's kind of a data variable. It exists within our data set, MT cars. But for convenience, 
you know, dplyr allows us to write to write our expression as if um, as if the data set were kind of um, if we were like if the data set as if the data set were our environment, if I can put it that way. Again, I'm not sure if it's much clearer or not. No, that that's clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, whoops. Uh, all right. So we looked at we looked at quoting. Um, there are other flavors of quoting that I'm not going to get into now. That I think will come up next week um, as we talk about quotures. Um, but just suffice it to say that Arlang basically gives you, as does base R, but in particular R language, I think is what you'll, you would want to use, gives you tools to diffuse arguments. So basically to quote expressions um, so that those expressions can then be evaluated at a later point in the function. So not outside of the function, but within the function itself and at the moment and in the way that you as a developer decide. That, that that user provided expression will be evaluated. And likewise for, for symbols. So there are tools, tools to handle that. And just as there are tools to quote, there are tools to kind of do the opposite, to basically unquote expressions, um, unquote symbols, so that they can be evaluated in the context where you as the developer want them to be evaluated. Got it. So there's another, there's another um, kind of case that, that that exists that I think is they don't talk about at the book because I think oh wait maybe they do um, but anyway it is where you can you know, like previously basically what we'd seen is you know there's a function to quote and there's a function to unquote and then implicitly you know like you as a developer need to do both things you need within the body of the function you know first move quote second move unquote right. Um, you know, for fairly straightforward functions, um, there, there are ways to do this more simply. So let's kind of look at how to like quote and unquote. First, we'll look at what I'm going to call the hard way, and then I'll look, describe what I think is the easier, easier way. Um, um, so the hard way would, would be this. Like, let's say you want to do a summarize command, and you wanted to do it the hard way. So you do exactly as I described. You know, first thing you do within the function is you would diffuse or quote this variable. Um, so let's imagine the variable you pass to it is a bear, it's a bear name, right? Uh, like you would provide in the tidyverse, for example. Uh, so first you need to diffuse, you know, to, to quote to quote the argument and diffuse evaluation. So first move. And then second move is you would need to inject it into um, some function where you do something, or in other words, unquote. So first quote, like we saw before, so this is a function in quo. Um, we'll maybe talk about the distinction um, in our next chapter. Uh, but basically this quotes the variable, and then here we're unquoting it in the way in which we saw using the bang bang operator. So here we can summarize whatever our data is, um, can, you know, create some variable column called mean, and where we're computing the mean, and here uh, basically we're passing this user provided uh, argument. I'm sorry, this shouldn't be arg, it should be um, var. Uh, I need to fix that in the notes. Um, and we're basically taking var, and then we're evaluating it in this context, in the context of the, of the data set where the column exists, presumably, right? That would be the hard way. Step number one, quote. Step number two, unquote. Luckily, there's an easier way. Um, so let's imagine we have this function easy summer, you know, my easy summarize. Same general setup. We have as a, an argument a data set uh, and some bare name um, for a variable that exists in the data set. Um, and in one move, we can basically quote and unquote using this embrace operator. Um, so we'll do summarize uh, data where the mean is this, and then this. Uh, this is called the embrace operator, the, or I think in other iterations, they've called it curly curly. Um, but in any, in, in any uh, uh, sense, like what you can think of kind of is maybe like a crude mental model for how this works. It sort of like takes this variable and then copy and pastes it here. 
so that this is, this is the expression that would be evaluated if you were doing it in, uh, you know, uh, running this computation in interactive mode. It just takes this bare name, copies and pastes it there. That's broadly speaking how it how it does it. But um, you know, like in principle, the function should maybe try to evaluate, like resolve the reference to this uh, uh, to the symbol, whatever the user provides as var. Um, and then once it's kind of resolved that, you know, pass that thing here. But instead, what we're doing behind the scenes, and this is through the magic of Arlang that I don't fully understand, is we're doing exactly what's shown in the hard way. It's just from our perspective as like someone writing a function, we've got an easier, some easier syntax. So we're diffusing and um, uh, injecting. So we're kind of quoting and unquoting in one in one move right there. So this can be done in, in, in general for, for any single variable um, eh, with, um, with R, but um, there are also cases where you can do this for multiple arguments, but it's not always the case. So kind of for what, I, what I've gleaned from the discussion and um, I think principally in the R lang documentation is that you can, you can you can kind of, for for func you can kind of pass this dot dot dot. Um, you can kind of I guess pass the dots in a certain sense. So I guess they call them dynamic dots. Um, in simple cases where you know, like up here, like the general idea is you want to take some uh, list of variables, let's say, uh, and then pass them here. So for example, for dplyr's group by, um, you just want a list of group grouping variables, right? So you kind of capture here and pass here. So you're kind of passing passing the dots. Again, like the, the very kind of simplistic mental model is you're kind of copy, you're copy pasting um, whatever the user writes here, uh, you know, this list of bare names and then pasting it, pasting it there. Um, and then it works. Um, this, this only works in cases, as I understand, where the function um, I could be wrong about this part, but where the underlying function being used accepts the dot dot dot. Um, or where it, it uses tidy select, but there's a different mechanism for doing that. In other cases, in general, kind of the, you know, you'd want to employ the, this kind of two-step move where you're going to, you're going to first quote, um, you're going to quote the user input uh, inside the function, the in quotes, um, and then, and then un, um, uh, unquote it with the bang, bang, bang operator. So here, it's kind of interesting. I, I, this is an example I think I stole from Arlang documentation. Um, so if, if we kind of take this function um, and just evaluate it out, uh, you know, uh, you know, pass the empty cars data set to my group by, um, you'll notice here, like I, I can I can have a set of, this is one expression and this is another expression. I'm just passing the expression. So we're psych where this number of cylinders equals the number of cylinders times 100. So we're scaling the number of cylinders by 100. Uh, so this would be a six cylinder car. This would be a four cylinder car in the original data set. We're scaling it by 100. Um, uh, so we're grouping by by those. Um, it's like a data modification step almost. And then, then we have the uh, this AM, AM variable. Autom I guess it's automatic. I'm not sure what the AM variable stands for. Um, but again, you know, this this only works in certain select cases, and I guess you'd need to see for your case if it's if the um, the functions that you're using in the body of the um, of of your of your function kind of support this kind of like passing of I guess the dynamic dots. Um, in all other cases, you have to go through this two-step process: first quoting the user inputs. Um, and then unquoting them. Um, I guess kind of the simple simple reason is that, you know, whereas you have this embrace operator that works for single variables, you don't. There's no plural version of the embrace operator, um, at least not yet. So, where might you kind of use this quasi quotation? Um, there are a few contexts, and maybe this will provide some 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 practical ideas of how this works and where it could be used in functions that you might think about writing. Um, so one is data masking, another is tidy selection, third is kind of broader topic of kind of metaprogramming. Um, 
First is kind of data masking. So um, with Arlang, you have these, um, they call them pronouns uh, that, that can basically indicate for each variable um, where, what kind of variable the, the, the function is dealing with. Is it, an, is it a data frame variable? So that you have this data pronoun, or is it an, an environment variable from you know, whatever the, the parent environment is? Um, in which case it would be this environment pronoun. So why might you want to do that? I think this is kind of a really nice motivating example. Like, like let's imagine that you have in, the, in your environment some variable that unfortunately has a name that collides with a name of a column in the data set where you're going to perform a computation. In, this, in our case, empty cars, right? Empty cars, we know, contains a, um, a variable named uh, CYL, so for number of cylinders, and then we're creating in the global environment um, uh, some CYL variable that has a certain value. So there's, there's collision, right, the, between, between the names. Um, and, you know, R is just has its kind of way of kind of looking at the environment and, and then determining, you know, which, what thing we mean. That may yield surprising results in some case. So here, let's say we wanted to compete, you know, compute some kind of mean, um, uh, you know, with a summarized statement. In each case, we're going to refer to a different CYL variable. In the first computation as a mean, where it's the mean with, you know, relative to the data, um, then we're going to basically take the column from our data set. So in this case, we have this under, uh, dot data uh, dollar sign CYL. Um, and this is going to refer to the, the CYL, the cylinders variable in the empty cars data set. Similarly, we could we could compute the mean of the, the environment variable CYL. Um, and here we do exactly that. So compute the mean. And so that we can denote that this is the environment variable and not the data frame variable, we have this pronoun dot env dollar sign CYL. So in this way, we can kind of disambiguate um, for the function. Um, which variable we want. Um, I guess for people that are working in, 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 in uh, what do you call it, in um, um, package development, um, I mean, oftentimes you'll you'll need this, if if only uh, you know for, for this RMD check uh, error, maybe it's a, only a warning um, that says you know certain symbols don't exist in the global environment, and, and you know like let's say we didn't have these pronouns. You know, basically, we're running the risk that our function may not behave as we expect when the end user has in their global environment some variable whose name conflicts with a data frame variable, the name of a data frame variable. Uh, so to be on the safe side, the best practice is to kind of explicitly indicate um, kind of what the, I guess, scope or, you know, kind of where, where R should go looking for for this 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 symbol, you know, is it a symbol that uh, denotes a column in the data set, or a symbol that denotes um, a variable in in the in the parent environment? And there's there's some references here if you want to if you want to learn more about this this data masking. Um, second thing, um, I guess for the kind of quasi quotation, uh, maybe this isn't quasi quotation precisely, but this is kind of a related topic. Um, is you know maybe you wanted to do something with with um, with uh, tidy selection where you wanted to select for for your function a certain number of columns, um, so you could have some variable. I mean this is kind of done in interactive mode, but you can easily imagine I hope uh, how this might work if we were to write a function where the user passed a, you know a list or a vector of of column of column names um, for which they wanted to perform some operation. Like let's say, select these variables and then compute the mean. You know, use dplyr across and com compute the mean for all all of those columns. So we could provide this this uh, this vector of of column names, um, and then and then you know in our pipeline we can select them and then in this case just just looking at the looking at the the output data set with glimpse. Um, there are two ways you can kind of handle this. Uh, the strictest is with you know all of. Uh, so basically it'll It'll error if one of these named columns doesn't exist in the in the data set. Uh, so you can see here we have weight, miles per gallon, and then some some fictitious column name not in empty cars, which, as its name indicates, is not in the empty cars data set. 
Uh, so because it's not, this will this will generate an, an error. Um, but if we want to be a bit more permissive, uh, we could say, you know, if any of these columns exist, select those columns and then, you know, continue on with some operations. So there's this any of, which is a lot more permissive way within tidy select of, 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 of doing the tidy selection. Um, I guess on to kind of meta programming, maybe this is, I guess these parts are, I guess you could say kind of bonus material in a certain sense. The, the chapter didn't cover them explicitly, but I, I thought those, it was useful to, to look at them because I, I, I found the chapter to be a little bit too, at least to my lights, abstract. I kind of really wanted some practical examples. And um, each one of these, these kind of common patterns of, 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 of metaprogramming, these are, these are covered in some detail in the R, in the R Lang documentation. So I guess I'll just briefly talk about, you know, just mention what they are and then, and then we can since, uh, you know, briefly look at them in the, in the documentation. If, if you have time and if you think this is something that might be of interest to you, I strongly encourage you to look at the documentation. The documentation is, is really good. It may take some study and some practice, but it's, it's, it's really good. Um, so one pattern is simply what they call forwarding. So this would be maybe a case where we'd want to use the embrace operator. So you just are taking some user input, you're diffusing it and injecting it without any modification. Um, that might be one pattern um, um, where you want to have like a kind of tidy verse API for, for, for your function uh, where the user passes bare names. So you got to quote those, you know, diffuse those bare names and inject those bare names into some kind of, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, uh, pipeline in your function. Uh, another thing is maybe you 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 uh, another pattern. Whoops, sorry. It's, uh, they call them this documentation uh, uh, names, where the workflow is as they describe it as symbolize and then inject. So this is maybe something like what I, I talked about earlier. Where let's say you're working, you're creating a function that you want to play well with with a shiny app. And the shiny app is going to pass you, um, you know, a character string that contains the name of the column that that your your app should do something with. Um, then, in that case, within the function, you want to convert this character string into a symbol, um, and then inject that symbol and evaluate it in some kind of some kind of pipe pipeline. Um, and then the last two, I guess, are more advanced, where, like broadly speaking, what you're going to do is you're going to capture the user inputs. Then you're going to do some manipulation of those user inputs. Um, you know, either transform into different representations for kind of different for different requirements of functions in your pipeline, or you want to compose like an unevaluated function call by taking you know user inputs, putting it in the right place for um, for your um, for your function, and then and then finally evaluating it. Those are kind of broadly speaking the the moves you, you you would make with the meta programming. These are kind of the broad the broad strategies. Um, and then if you want to look at any of this stuff further, uh, I think there are a few really nice places to look. If you're short on time um, or just like prefer watching things first to get a sense uh, instead of reading, um, there's some great videos. So there's some, um, uh, actually I guess kind of the, the entry point is, uh, that there's a nice workshop during the uh, 2022 R Studio Comp. I think Trevin, you you participated in this one. Um, uh, that there's a, a slide deck that that kind of provides us uh, kind of a very nice overview about how practically as a package uh, developer to use um, tidy eval. Um, and and it importantly it provides kind of like modern solutions. What you see in the book is a little dated with respect. Uh, to kind of um, the state of the art of our Arlang, um, but this this um, this workshop has some nice slides that provide practical examples and exercises. And then within those slides, at the very end, they they have a compilation of videos. Um, one video uh, is from the 2019 R Studio Comp for Jenny Bryan provides a little bit of a motivation for <clears throat> an explanation for um, what tidy eval is, uh, what problem it's trying to solve and kind of generally how it works. Then there's a, a, a Lionel Henry uh, talk from, I think it was a 2020 uh, RStudio Conf that looked at reasonably modern Rlang and how, how, it, how it works. Um, and then there's a kind of a, a short five minute Hadley video um, uh, that, that 
brings us all back to kind of abstract syntax tree. If you have a bit more time, um, these are some really nice documents. I think I started learning one of my first entry points and the tidy eval was with this programming with dplyr uh, vignette uh, to the dplyr documentation. There's another similar one for G ggplot2. Um, I mentioned earlier the rlang vignettes are really quite good. Um, in the past, I always found rlang documentation really frustrating, um, but now the vignettes are, offer a really wonderful walkthrough. Uh, and then last document, this is something that I, I looked at back in the day uh, and I, I presume is still useful, um, but it's actually marked as superseded. Uh, there was meant to be a book on tidy eval um, that, um, uh, that, uh, that Hadley and uh, Lionel were, were, were drafting. Um, the, repo's been, the repo's been archived, uh, it's marked as superseded, but here's a link to it. And I think someone in the community has actually kind of uh, knitted the book and made it available for people who, who, who want to look at the book. It's even though some of the solutions are out, you know, kind of outdated, they still speak, I think, to a lot of the practical problems the developers might have. They offer solutions. The solutions may not be the optimal solutions, but still they, they give you a nice idea of what's what's going on and how to answer it. I guess with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I, I, I talked way too long. Um, maybe I'll see if there are any questions or concerns or comments. Over to you guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You really uh, made it clear. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any questions uh, for, for now. But I'll see next next week for the second part. And yeah, I don't know if anyone else would like to ask any questions, maybe, or share some uh, personal experience with the quotations or semi quotations or bam 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 <laughs> any of those uh, things. Yeah, I don't have any questions, but yeah, this this was a I really enjoyed uh, this presentation, Arthur. Um, I'll, I'll definitely have to take a look at some of those extra um links that you provided as well those those will be helpful awesome have you um have you used um quasi quotation or like um any of the, any of these concepts in your like personal code yeah, I have. Um, I, I I have. Um, yeah, I I have. Like I, I um, there's actually a package that I'm I'm kind of working on right right now. I mean, I it's 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 up it's up on my GitHub repo, um, where like the the challenge was sort of um, <clears throat> for these for some household surveys that were um, kind of like a broad group of data collectors, uh, data collection implementation agencies around the world. So think national statistics offices, um, you know, I think principally in, but not exclusively in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, they're, they're doing um, uh, like broadly, like their questionnaires are kind of the same variable names, however, may differ from one, from one context to another, but like a lot of the data tracking needs are the same. Uh, and so I, what I've had to do with these functions is say like, okay, I want to track the extent to which um, agricultural plots are being measured with handheld GPS device. Um, basically to see if there are any indications that interviewers might be getting lazy and, and uh, you know, saying, oh, well, the plot is too far, you know, kind of systematically doing so that may, may be cause for concern. And like, that's a case where uh, I had to sort of take... Um, basically take, uh, maybe rather than do a lot of hand waving. Um, from here, I'll go to the GitHub repo. Maybe look, I can show some of the docs. Yeah, I basically had to, and in this context, I'm working with, like, I presume this is gonna be using the, the, the um, uh, shiny context. And so kind of what I'll do is I'll have uh, a certain vari variable um, 
and and then I'll, I'll that it'll be a string, and I'll have to kind of quote it. Um, uh, so you can see kind of some some Arlang Arlang in action. Um, for example, uh, I take this grouping variable, and I'm I'm you know it's a string that's being passed here, and then I've I've got it as a as a as a symbol. Like I convert it into a symbol, and then later on I'm 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 evaluating it at some point. So I haven't looked at this code in a little while, so I may not be the best tour guide of the code. But yeah, uh, short short answer, Trevor, is yes, uh, definitely definitely have. Uh, not sure if this is over engineering, but this is something that I like struggled to learn how to do, and so uh, I don't know. Maybe the un. Uh, you know, it's like when you all you know all you have is a hammer. Everything in the world looks like a nail. So I, I think that's kind of. <laughs> Potentially, why I've done this a, a lot, but I'm I, I use Arlang a, a fair bit. Oh yeah, here there's there's the bang bang right there. What about you guys? Have you have you found yourselves using this? Oh, very cool. Um, the the shiny app that I I didn't implement it, but it it's used in. Um, the shiny app that I'm maintaining. Um, and I think that um, the CLI package had a change recently and, and that caused a break in the code. Like the code still ran, but there was like, there's a silent bug. And I think part of it was how they, the way the CLI package changed how, I think quasi quotation was like written out or something like that. So yeah, some some experience, but um, this is this is helpful where I can like write my own. Yeah, I mean it's it's super it's super powerful, but it feels I don't know, to me it's always felt a little difficult. But I mean I guess it's difficult relative to what I know. And for example, in in Stata, you know, this other statistical software package, this kind of stuff is made really easy. Uh, the language has a lot. I, I kind of feel like their implementation of this is uh, one of the superpowers of of Stata as as a language. Stata may have a lot of other failings, but that's that's like one one strong area for R. It always felt like you had to work a lot. Work a lot harder um, to achieve to achieve the same, but I feel like the tooling around this with Arlang is has substantially improved over time. Like the, the embrace operator, I mean that just makes your life so much easier. Um, uh, uh, and then also, I guess other things that I, I'd found myself doing in the past, I didn't cover here. I don't know where they sit in terms of this book. Is a uh, creating kind of creating variable names. Um, this this chapter goes over it a little bit. This um, symbol, the semicolon equal sign, or I also heard it called like the walrus operator, um, it, like where you can kind of on the left hand side have like a, a name, like a string name uh, that you can kind of construct. I think in recent Arlang now you can use glue, for example, to construct variable names, which makes it so much easier than rather than having to compose them by hand in a separate separate step. So all that to say, like. I feel like Arlang is getting much easier to use over time. That's my general impression. That being said, it's still there's still, a, to my sense, like a a sort of steep learning curve. Um, but I think made easier by tools like um, like this really these really great slides from the I think the the, the workshop I believe you attended, um, uh, Trevin, uh, like building tidy tools. They go over this tidy. Tidy eval with a lot of worked, a lot of worked examples. That that uh, I mean, I just kind of peruse this, but it looked really, really um, like a really useful resource. I actually learned some things that I'd never, I'd never learned. I didn't know were possible for uh, before, like the tidy select piece. I didn't know you could do that. Let's see if I find the tidy select piece. All right, maybe 
I'm not going to find it. Anyway, the, long story short, these slides are really good. I feel like the RLang package, um, I actually noticed, I, I was hoping that I could kind of refer to the cheat sheet that for RLang, there used to be one that exist, existed. I think it's been deprecated, but it. Uh, I feel like this is a package that probably probably needs a cheat sheet somehow, although I don't know how, how easily digestible the cheat sheet will be. Um, I don't know if the following makes will make sense to many people, but um, I kind of, uh, used to and hope to in future play a lot of board games and, and like a, a lot of these things is like you have sort of certain resources that are of certain type and the game is like you convert them into another type through some actions and I, it kind of feels like our lang is very much the same like I have a I have here a bear name and I want to make the bear name or I'm sorry I have here a string a character string and then I want to convert it you know I want to change it into um I want to change it into a uh um, a symbol, uh, and then you know later I have to evaluate the symbol. I feel like Arlen could definitely use with the, the cheat sheet of how you could see these kind of conversions between types of things. Um, sorry, so I belatedly seeing if there's a chat. Oh, okay, got it. I'm checking the uh, cheat sheets we got at the conference. I'm not seeing it right now. Yeah, I had to dredge it up from, I feel like, um, an archive of the internet or something. Uh, I had it from a previous R Studio conf that I, I attended. Um, oh. And it was back in 2019. And it was, uh, it was useful, but still difficult. I feel like the vignettes, the Arling vignettes are just uh, a, a godsend. Uh, they are, they're really, really useful both for um, kind of like an overview of what, you know, what a lot of the tidy evaluation is, whether you need it, um, and then and certain patterns about how you go about doing particular things that I guess are kind of common, common, um, common needs. Yeah, they do, they do a great job with, with that. Because the names, like I feel like tidyverse in general, the names are really names of functions are really evocative of purpose, and not so much I feel for for our lang. Or you have to understand their whole philosophy and things before before the functions kind of make make sense. But for example, like what's the difference between expra and inquo? <laughs> it's kind of a very subtle difference. What does as label do as opposed to as name? Cool. Well, anyway, thanks. Thanks guys for, for bearing with me as I kind of blundered my way through the chapter. Um, uh, yeah, hope, yeah. Hope, hope, hopefully, hopefully it was useful in some sense and hopefully, hopefully you guys will come away. If not this time, then, then, a few weeks from now of like some some understanding of how what, what this all is and how it works yeah thank you very much okay see you next week all right see you all next week bye all right bye bye